Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on navigating the global shipping crisis. We're glad that you could join us this morning. We're excited for the conversation today. Uh, for those of you who may not yet know who World Trade Center Utah is, we are a member of the broader World Trade Center Association that has more than 300 members in more than 90 countries across the globe. Here in Utah, the World Trade Center Utah exists to accelerate growth for Utah companies through the, our networks, our services, and our programs. And as part of that work, we coordinate with partners to, um, uh, to delve into issues related to everything from marketing and sales um, and, uh, and supply chains and inventory management and, and pretty much act as a thought leader here in the state on all things international. Uh, today, our, dis our topic of discussion is the global shipping crisis. Nearly every company in Utah right now in one way or another is impacted by the, the increased shipping costs and increased lead times that are a result of uh, a number of different forces happening in the, in the global logistics industry today. Um, and it's our goal today to understand what is going on, why it's happening, what impacts they may have on, on us here in Utah, on our companies, and also on, on our economy. And then also to discuss what it is that Utah companies can do uh, to, to navigate this crisis and to ensure reliable shipping uh, options for themselves. Um, a special thank you to a few of our partners here on the line today, the Salt Lake Chamber, um, and also to Utah's Inland Port Authority. Both of them have been incredibly useful as we've been reaching out to, to the carriers, to other logistics providers, to Utah companies, and even to regulators as we've tried to wrap our heads around what's going on in the global economy and how it is that Utah companies can address it. Today, we're, we're joined by a few experts who will be able to really elucidate this, uh, this problem for, for all of you who've joined today. Uh, we're joined by Jack Hedge, who's the executive director of Utah's Inland Port Authority and has been, uh, has been with us since uh, for a little more than two years now, since 2019. Jack has done a great job of positioning Utah as a future leader on, uh, glo on sustainable global supply chains um, and on smart logistics infrastructure that, uh, that will make Utah a center of, of uh, logistics, not only in the U.S., but around the world here in the near future. We're also joined by Jason Fowler, the president and CEO of Air and Sea International, a Utah homegrown Utah freight forwarding and customs broker business, um, and a partner and great member of World Trade Center Utah. Uh, Jason, as well as, uh, as uh, running his own company, is also the vice president of the European Freight Forwarders Association. We're also joined by Jeffrey Steed, who's the executive vice president and chief, um, uh, chief legal counsel for, uh, for Maloof and Companies which is located a, a great fast growing company located in, in Cache Valley. Uh, Jeff has a fantastic resume, is also a partner at Tamarack Capital um, and, uh, and is one of our uh, Utah's 40 under 40 uh, here in the state. Finally, we're also joined by Troy Keller, who is our trade policy advisor here at World Trade Center Utah um, and, is also, uh, and has also been at Dorsey Whitney now for, for a little while. Uh, before joining Dorsey, Troy was the uh, Vice President of Corporate Law and Global Government Relations at Huntsman Corporation and also brings a fantastic wealth of experience with him to, to discuss these issues. Um, thank you all, Jack, Jeff, Troy, and Jason for being here. Um, as, we, as we get started uh, today with this conversation, I want to share a brief story, uh, a brief story to, to ground our conversation. You know, at World Trade Center Utah, it's our goal to make Utah the crossroads of the world one business at a time, which means that, uh, is, which is a nice way of saying that we're here to help Utah companies and give each and every Utah company the, the attention that they need and the support that they need to succeed uh, all around the globe. Um, and so as a, you know, as a result, we get a lot of calls from companies all over, all over Utah who, who need help with very specific and technical issues, one of whom called me last week because as a small manufacturer in, in northern Utah, uh, he had a significant back order uh, due to the fact that he couldn't he couldn't locate supply. So he invested a quarter million dollars in a bulk order to um, to help him to, to solve his issues. Um, and that bulk order has been stuck in customs or, or has been stuck or he believed was stuck at the port for more than five weeks, um, which means that he was losing business as a result of as a result of the delays and the increased shipping costs that he had to pay. Uh, in order to get that bulk order here and it's somewhat on time. Uh, we found out at talking to, to the carrier and then also to the railroad, they were, they were pointing fingers back and forth as to who was supposed to provide a chassis and, and, and other issues. Um, with a few calls, we found out that his issue wasn't, wasn't just that he didn't have a chassis for his container, but also that his container wasn't even at the port yet. 
um, and that it was sitting it was sitting in a ship off seas and, and had yet even to be unloaded in, into the port itself. Um, uh, just a myriad of issues he was dealing with. And, and to this day, we, we haven't quite yet seen a resolution there um, uh, for him to be able to get his product up here and, and, and out to his customers. So this is indicative of, of what we're seeing across the board with Utah manufacturers and other companies who are importing, particularly from Asia. And, and, and my question to each of you, and, and maybe I'll start Jack with you and then Jason, if you could uh, comment on this, how did we get here? What is happening in our, in our global logistics uh, industry today that that's causing these increased uh, shipping times and these these long delays. Well, yeah, thanks, Jim, and I, I, I appreciate that. And I'll kick it off. Although I think Jason should kick it off because he has the best mustache in the business. It's just, it's <laughs> great, it's a great facial hair. But uh, but actually, it you know what what got us here is a perfect storm. Uh, it it and, and and that sounds and I don't mean to trivialize or sound trite. Uh, it truly is a perfect storm. Uh, we, there was already the, 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 the global su uh, supply and logistics system, particularly in the trans-Pacific trade, was already running along at a fairly high rate uh, prior to the pandemic. Uh, there was already congestion at the, at the, at the ports uh, because of just the volume, the sheer volume of imports and exports that were going through those ports. Once we had the pandemic and, 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 and the supply chains got shattered, uh, for, for manufacturers, for, for importers, and for exporters. Uh, it, it, it exacerbated those problems. And everything from, from suppliers not being able to be, to be caught without, without inventory again, uh, thrown in on top of a just-in-time system that already was sort of running at that, at that, at that edge, um, it, it just melted the system down. Uh, and frankly, there's no end in sight. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a limited capacity to make more equipment. There's limited capacity to, to uh, get more trucks and, and rail cars and, and, and chassis and containers and ship to shore cranes and vessels. Um, and, and, and there is a driver shortage and there is a rail worker shortage. And there is even a shortage of longshore workers. It is literally everything that could go wrong has gone wrong. Uh, so it, it, it's going to take time to work through it. It's going to take time to work it out. Government, uh, industry, everyone is working hard to come up with solutions, um, but it is going to take time to recover from the storm. Thank you. Jason? Yeah, I would just like to add on. I mean, Jack pretty much nailed it on the head. The, you know, COVID was the, one of the biggest um, contributors to this. But if you, if you go back a little ways, the consolidation of the steamship lines, that is a huge, huge, huge uh, part of this whole dynamic. Uh, you can go back to the to the debacle with Hanjin, how it went bankrupt. So these carriers just started buying up each other, and realistically, you've only got three alliances with what nine or ten carriers really, and so you have limited you have limited supply, and then now they can control the market. So um, I don't know when this is going to um, alleviate or get better, but uh, vaccinations around the, around the world would certainly help. Uh, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, resurgence of the COVID in a lot of the Asian countries, which just shuts manufacturing right down as well. So there's a lot of, lot of issues. Yeah, it seems like this issue isn't just a, it's not just the fact that there are, you know, a million containers stuck at the wrong port at this point. Really, we're talking about systemic issues that started with a consolidation in the shipping industry, um, and, and really high run rates between, uh, particularly in the trans-Pacific trade that uh, once COVID hit and, and it melted down the system and manufacturing and, and, and uh, uh, work, the workforce at the ports and everything else, we've, we've really kind of hit a perfect storm, Jack, as, as you've mentioned. Uh, given that this is systemic, this isn't just an issue with industry, but uh, there are also some government, uh, some, some government regulations that come into play here as well. Troy, you've been speaking with, with regulators. Are, are there any regulations that you found as, uh, have been particularly uh, burdensome here or that have made this crisis worse? Uh, I think right now the regulators are in the mode of what can we do to, to help the situation. And um, I, yeah, I don't, I mean, people will point to this or that as regulatory hurdles in particular, you know, the fact like some of the infrastructure that we, that we wish we had right now don't, is that because it, you know, it takes longer to build a port than, than it should. And, 
And those are, I think those are, those, none of those are gonna fix our current situation right now. So I think the, the issue now is what can regulators do to help given the infrastructure that we have in place. And, um, and yet we've had some incredible conversations uh, both with our federal delegation and with uh, the Federal Maritime Commission. Uh, Jack and I were on a call with them yesterday and they, they are giving this, they're all like, we, you know, we, we're, we, you know, we've called on behalf of uh, World Trade Center and Inland Port and kind of Utah as a, you know, as a, uh, uh, as a group. And, and we got, you know, little old Utah, I mean, they, they had, I think, seven regulators on the phone with us, an, a sitting commissioner for the FMC. They are desperate for information. They want to make a difference, but it's tough. It's a little unclear to them. Uh, what they can do in the short term. Long term, you know, they can they can push for legislation and do some rulemaking that will, you know, again, improve uh, improve congestion through additional spending and infrastructure, et cetera. In the short term, do they have the ability to go out and, and just put a cap on rates uh, or to tell, you know, ship, you know, carriers where they should, you know, where they should dock and uh, no, those are all kind of market market forces. However, uh, they have a bully pulpit and they've invited us and I think as, uh, Jim is some, you know, something we can do. We have, we have people on the phone here right now. I, we can invite people to, you know, if they have specific stories and we'll keep everything anonymous. Don't worry, no one's gonna have their head, you know, popped up and become a target for, for carriers or, or regulators, but please share your stories with us and um, we'll package those up and they are interested in, in hearing specifics. They need that kind of information. Thank you, Troy. Jeff, you've been living this day to day at Maloof. Tell me, what's the situation on the ground for you, and and what are you seeing from uh, on your supply side as you try to uh, as you try to secure reliable service? Sure, um, and let me kind of get back up and just kind of speak to as to you know, kind of the number of variables as to why this you know occurred originally, and then I can answer the question. But um, you know, one of the things we discussed earlier, Jim, is is the trade and and, and tensions and tariffs. Um, have had an enormous impact on this. It's not like, you know, I mean, look, as economists, we, we try to, you know, isolate variables and we try to analyze variables in this vacuum and, and say, well, this caused this or this caused this. But the truth is, is this, there's a myriad of, 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 uh, of factors at play here. Um, now, COVID obviously could be argued to be, you know, or the consolidation in the carriers could be argued to be the, the straw that broke the camel's back. But let's be honest here, you know, when we're talking about trade tensions and tariffs, we have seen enormous increases in tariffs. And look, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not just the U.S. Um, this is a, this is a global issue where, you know, a return to free and fair trade would help greatly in this situation. And I say free and fair trade. Um, you know, just just given the situation, for example, with the International Trade Commission, you know, we've seen the number of anti-dumping cases over the last 10 years increase sixfold over the previous decade. Um, obviously, what that does is that creates uh, uncertainty, that creates confusion, that creates uh, firms such as Maloof, uh, Maloof now being one of the largest top 50 importers in the U.S. in any industry, uh, you know, it, it, it causes us to pivot and when we pivot, well, guess what? Capacities pivot um, because when big players like Maloof or you know some of the bigger you know importers in the U.S. start having to pivot because of of, of uncertain trade policies that are happening within the U.S., well, you know the carriers almost can't keep up. Uh, they've got to move ships around. They've got to they've got to you know move logistics around. They've got to move overhead and equipment, and and and, and it creates a challenge. There's no question. And so what I want to make clear is this. Yes, there were unforeseen variables in this case, largely COVID. There were, and there were variables that quite frankly were beyond uh, the scope of our, of our crystal ball, if you will, like you know, maybe certain large ocean carriers can continue to consolidate. And we just saw you know, yesterday you know, that the Maersk is also you know, continuing its consolidation efforts. But there were things that, quite frankly, we could and should have foreseen for some time now. And, and look, I'm not pointing the fingers at any uh, uh, administration or anything of that nature. This isn't a political issue, in my opinion. As an economist, a return to free and fair trade uh, policy is absolutely critical. Um, but, but, but to answer the question with respect to Maloof, I mean, look, you know, uh, the, the, the only thing that can be described is, you know, to answer your question is uncertainty. Uh, we're doing great. Uh, we're, we, we 
continue to grow very rapidly and, 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 and expand our, our business operations. Um, and we're having success in doing so, but, 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 but it is frustrating because, because the answer is it's, it's just blatantly uncertain and, and the costs, the costs are, are obviously increasing. And what does that do? Well, that ultimately affects the, 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 the cost to the US consumer. Um, which is which is extremely unfortunate. Um, you know, we play very heavily. One out of every five mattresses now sold in the United States is a Maloof mattress. You don't know that because we sell under 433 different brands and trademarks that we own. Uh, but the, the point is this, already we've seen prices of say mattresses increase by over 40% over the last six months. Uh, and we suspect the American Mattress Alliance, which we're a part of, uh, Ashley Furniture is a part of that, we're a part of that, RC Willie, uh, other, other corporations are part of that. Um, we suspect, our, according to our research, uh, that uh, over the next 24 months, mattress prices in the US could increase by another 300%. Now, if you think about that and think about the, what type of impact that would have on the average American consumer who, who sleeps on a mattress and relies on that, that could have a pretty, pretty serious impact uh, on the United States economy. Thank you, Jeff. We're, we're all concerned here about what the broader impact is going to be, not only on our companies, but as you mentioned, the American consumer, um, all, of, all of us are having to deal with inflationary pressures right now, and, and there's a lot of concern about that. I want to continue on this vein, and, and Jason and Troy and, and Jack, I'd ask you to answer next. Uh, as you speak with companies on the ground, as you work with your clients, what impacts are you seeing um, what are the what are the long term concerns, short and long term concerns for your clients? Uh, lo lo short term is obviously the, the pain points of using the spot market to get their containers moved. Uh, long term, you know, it's the alliances. You know, honestly, I think uh, the alliances have kind of figured it out how to. You know, they lost money for twelve years and they're just trying to make it all back in one, which I think they did. But uh, they, they've got the supply and demand. They can pull capacity when they want to, when prices become too low, which they do. They do it all the time. You know, we get blank sailings. Um, and they, they're kind of, you know, they, they run roughshod. You know, they can, uh, they can, with the regulations, you know, you can put a lot of regu U.S. regulations on these companies. But realistically, if you break up the alliances, then your services suffer. You get a lot less sailings. Um, you get a lot, you know, just from main ports. So it would. There's a lot of really bad side effects uh, to some of these regulations that people are talking about. Thank you, Jason. Yeah. Troy, why don't you go next? Sure. Yeah, I think that the companies that we're talking to, very similar to what what Jeff what, what Jeff described, uh, the importers and the exporters are just they're just. They're in a battle first to find space to get the product in. That's number one, and then cost is number two. And and so far, I mean, you see, we've seen price you know spikes for the consumer in you know in housing here in Utah and in automobiles, obviously. But I'm afraid it's going to come soon in other areas because so far, I think the manufacturers, the importers have been swallowing it. Um, but you know, like like Jason said, the you know the the uh, the carriers. 16 billion in earnings for the top four carriers in the first quarter. Um, it's an astronomical number. They are trying to make it make it back and you know, make hay, you know, while the while the sun shines. Um, but that is, but that's, but that's putting in, uh, incredible pressure, especially on our Utah companies. Most of them, most manufacturers here are the small and the mid-sized manufacturers. So they can't, you know, they're, they're a little, they're caught in that no man's zone. They're a little too big to. Uh, to use, you know, FedEx. I mean, there's some businesses that really can just survive on FedEx and their materials, um, but they're they're too big for that. But they're not big enough to to have leverage um, like some of the you know, some of the much larger carriers and, or shippers. And so they are in this no man's land where they've just got to scramble. And, and like Jim, the example you described, you know, thank goodness we have resources like World Trade Center here and and a lot of professionals in town that can help help people scramble as they they try to find. You know, space on, on a cargo ship, but but there's just there's just intense competition for that. So um, it's tough. The last thing I'll mention there is, as an inland state, uh, we face uh, a little bit, I'd say, a marginal uh, extra. Once once stuff gets to the shore, usually it get it can get here in pretty good order into Utah. Uh, but 
you know, it's still a little delayed beyond what it used to be. Uh, so uh, the railroads, I think I heard, had, had during COVID had laid off uh, a good sort of double digit percentage of their employees. They're working hard to get those back. Uh, so things are delayed. They're getting here, but they're they're delayed a little bit. So, so to your question, I think companies are, you know, like like Jeff described, they're they're making do, but but it's tough and it's and it's not it's not good long term. I think short term anyone can survive it, but long term, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, but it's tough. Jack. Yeah, I mean one of one of the big one of the biggest impacts we we're seeing is from exporters, and in the Intermountain West, those tend to be you know smaller companies, smaller you know, smaller producers whether they be manufacturers or, but mostly it's, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, producers of agricultural products and, and minerals and uh, being unable to get access to equipment so that their, their, uh, their equipment can be loaded, their, their exports can be loaded and, and getting back out. Uh, that's had a, that's had a devastating effect on, on several of our exporters, uh, which, which are, you know, a, a, a big part of our economy, a big part of our, uh, in the Intermountain West and, and, and nationally. Um, so, trying to deal with those issues, find, you know, get equipment, find equipment, make that a little more seamless. Uh, that's, that's been a big, uh, a big effort uh, to try to do that. The other thing I think is, is because of something that, that Troy brought up, a lot of the companies in our region, in our area, in our cargo shed are smaller companies. Uh, if, if, you know, if 50 boxes are coming into this market, uh, it's, it's, it's one thing you can, you got enough market power, you can, you can get your, you can get your, your, your goods. If one box is coming in, uh, your box is lost. It's, it's, it's in the stacks somewhere, uh, and it's and it's it's hard to get it's hard to get them out. So smaller companies like we like we talked about are really really being sold. Uh, their their box is not off the vessel yet. If it's off the vessel, it's in a stack. If it's if it's not in a stack, it's in a container yard somewhere, and it's it's just you know it's at the bottom of the barrel. It's at the bottom of the list. And trying to trying to deal with those types of issues and things are. It's, it's really, really tough on the smaller importers and the smaller exporters. Thank you, Jack. I think if I was a small business listening to this webinar right now, I might feel a little bit more concerned than I did previously. Maybe a little bit, a little bit more, a uh, little bit more pessimistic about the opportunity to return to a normal state of play here soon. I'd like to focus on on two questions. You know, in the next few minutes with with both of you, uh, with it, with all of you. The I think the first question on my mind is. If I'm a small company like like the kind that we're talking about here, I don't necessarily have a, a ton of leverage to use with the shippers. What can I do, if anything, right now to try to shore up my supply, to try to ensure um, a more regular, more reliable service? Is there anything that I can do? And then, and then the second question, I'll, and I'll ask it after we talk about the first is, um, what are going to be what are the long term impacts? Uh, I should say, what are the long-term changes that are going to come to the logistics industry as a result of what we're seeing here today, um, and and how is Utah how is Utah going to be involved in that? Um, particularly, Jack, from the, from an inland port perspective. So maybe Jeff, I'll I'll start by asking you, um, what do you think smaller companies can do here in the in the in Utah in the U.S. to try to shore up their supply chains? Oh, uh, you know, one of the things that you can do is try and is, is try to find trusted partners, um, um, obviously supply partners in areas that you feel comfortable um, in, 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 in engaging with on a contractual basis. You know, we have a wonderful relationship. I don't know if they're on the call today, but I know they're here in Utah, but OCL, you know, we, we use pretty much most of the major carriers. Um, I got it. I got to hand it to you. You know, OCL does a great job. And, and this is isn't a pitch so much for OSCL as much as an example of just quite frankly, you know, finding those relationships, quite frankly, that follow through uh, and, and, and do a good job and, 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 and shore up that relationship, not just from a business standpoint or operational standpoint, but contractually. Um, I think that that would probably be one of the best pieces of advice I could give. And let me, and let me add this too, you know, we're all like-minded people here um, with the World Trade Center, Utah. We want to see uh, businesses thrive here in Utah. We want to see business grow. We want to see uh, Utah continue to be enormous economic success, which it already has been. And I think there's a lot of players, you know, here uh, that are part of this panel and also in, in the in attendance that are, are a huge part of that. You know, joining just because you know competition is the name of the game doesn't mean that we can't be uh, uh, cooperative. Um, with respect to issues that affect all of us, like, for example, 
free and, free and fair trade policy. I'm just going to say it. In fact, there was a tweet by uh, Robert O'Brien. He's a, a board member of the World WTC Utah. He's a good friend of mine. He's a former national security advisor, fantastic lawyer. I consider him a mentor, but then he says this, you know, just yesterday, he says, let's get trade right and reward companies that bring manufacturing home, but let's also treat fairly those that near shore to US allies and partners, thus, created trust, thus creating trusted supply chains for American businesses and consumers. Now you can say, if, you know, if you're a small business, you know, you, know, you know, what can I do to effectuate change in this arena? You can do everything. It, 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 partnering with World Trade Center Utah, partnering with other like-minded organizations, you know, who, who, who want to see you succeed. And then using that as a platform to help, you know, open dialogue with our trusted leaders here in this state. And they are very good at, at getting things done and, 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 and effectuating change. That's what I would probably, so showing up contractual relationships and, and joining coalitions such as this. I think those are probably the two of the biggest things you can do. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, I want to point out a few things. One, that we, we have a few trusted partners on the line today, if you're a small business that you ought to be talking to. Uh, Jason Fowler uh, here, of course, Troy Keller um, as well. Both, both we work with really closely when our, when our Utah companies are having these issues. Um, but Jason and, 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 or maybe Troy, we'll start with you first, then Jason, same, same question to you. If, I, if I'm a small business in Utah today, what would you advise us to do to, to try to shore up our supply chains now um, and then I also like to Jeff's point to engage uh, in for to, to create long term change um, uh, here across in the nation. Go ahead, Troy. Yeah, you bet. And I'll start with the engagement piece. Uh, I mean, um, I'm a lawyer by, by trade as well. And so clearly there are things commercially like Jeff described you can do to help yourself find, you know, make a contract with with with, with a different partner, find the right partner um, from an engagement standpoint. Uh, you know, send us your stories, you know, send, send them to Jim or, or, or me or, or, or any of us really. And, and, and then we'll talk to you and figure out, you know, how, how, you know, because, because every company sits in a supply chain somewhere, maybe you sell directly to, to consumers, but maybe you sell, you know, to into the auto industry or into manual, the home manufacturing industry. And, and, and it's not going to be just you, you're going to have peers, that are and together you're going to be a very important part of the supply chain and when we get your voices together we have a lot of success in, in getting changes made that can help and that's not going to happen tomorrow but but it, it won't take years do that's something that can can you know can can create change and help uh, in, in the near term then last thing i'll say again to elaborate on on jeff's point on near shoring um uh we hear a lot about onshoring let's you know buy 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 goods from other people here in the us from you know manufacturers or suppliers or material suppliers uh, Nearshoring involves Canada, Mexico, Central America, even South America. Those are places where we have, in most most situations, really good you know logistical uh, lines that aren't nearly as impacted as the, the the situation of trying to get stuff from Asia back and forth. And it might you might say, well, it's more expensive to buy here in Mexico or Canada, and it might be, but compared to shipping costs that we got from three thousand dollars a container to twenty five thousand dollars a container. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be a really good hedge to find some suppliers uh, locally that uh, that can that can help you long term. Thank you, Troy. Jason. Yeah, <clears throat> I would just like to echo what uh, Troy and Jeff were saying. Um, Nearshoring would be, if if possible, would be very uh, helpful for a small business. And I know small businesses a lot of times, you know, don't they don't have enough volume for their own contracts, so they're going to have to seek out a freight forwarder, um, you know, like myself. But if you can find a trusted partner, that's the thing, somebody you can grow with. Because um, you know everybody can give you the cheapest rate, but you know to actually move your freight, it can be expensive. And right now is um, you know you, where you want your trusted partners. Um, you, places like the World Trade Center, you know, finding you know any avenue to help you succeed is the best way to go. Thank you. Uh, I'll note here that we are uh, together um, World Trade Center Utah and our partners are gathering together these stories. We're building a, a community of, of other manufacturers and companies here in the state that are dealing with these same issues uh, that we can we can work with to help to uh, provide some weight and momentum to these discussions. Uh, if you do if you do have some interest in participating and telling us your story, um, we'll we'll post uh, the contact information for Aaron Starks. 
Aaron Starks is our uh, Vice President of Global Business Services here at World Trade Center Utah. Um, and we'll, we'll funnel mo many of these stories through him and, and he'll be an organizer and an important point of contact there. We'll put his email in the chat so you can reach out to him and, and also in the follow-up email as a, um, at once this webinar is, is completed. Um, one reminder that we do have time for Q&A today. Uh, which will begin here in just a few minutes. If you have a question, please use the Q&A function below. You should be able to click on uh, the little Q&A box at the bottom of, of your screen. Uh, submit a question there, and then we'll take time to answer your questions throughout, uh, throughout the time we have left in the presentation. Jack, I, I wanna turn to you because this next question, this next question is, is more about what the future of the logistics industry looks like, and, and importantly, what role Utah has to play in alleviating some of the pressures uh, that, that have caused this meltdown, as you say, here in, in, in the logistics industry. Um, from your position as the executive director of the Inland Port, tell us what you think the future looks like in global trade and, and how does Utah's Inland Port fit in? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think there, first of all, I will say that the, 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 the port authorities on, on the coasts, on both coasts, uh, and, and are, are really working hard at this issue and trying to, to figure out solutions and different ways, ways of going forward. And the future is going to be much more, uh, I think, uh, flexible and 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 more alternatives, perhaps, than there are today. We got we got really used because of the weight of cargo flowing through Southern California, uh, the the system sort of evolved to be a very Southern California focused system in terms of the Trans Pacific trade, uh, and in particular the Trans Pacific trade that we that we rely on. Um, we're starting to see. Uh, the, working with our with our port authority, our sister port authorities on the west coast, alternative uh, services starting to crop up. Two new uh, services have been announced for the port of Oakland. Uh, first port of call services that did not exist, you know, six months ago. Uh, we've seen some other sort of start and stops with that, but I think these are, are, are finally starting to take shape and, and, and bend. So I think we will see new service offerings, uh, more alternatives. For, for people to, to, to have in terms of routing cargo uh, and, and just additional lanes and additional uh, flexibility. That's gonna mean additional, you know, and, and I, I think as we see additional equipment get put into the market or, or that, that will drive equipment to be reallocated across the spectrum, which really what that means is greater utilization of the assets that we have today. Uh, for example, there's not a whole heck of a lot of cargo that moves intermodally on the what, what I'll call the central the central route, the, the, the mainline rail route between Northern California and, and Chicago, which we sit on. The vast majority of cargo moving inland uh, moves through LA Long Beach and goes the southern route to Chicago, goes through through Arizona and El Paso in that route. So better allocation of assets and better utilization of the existing assets that we have is going to make a big difference. It, it will help avoid these, these real meltdowns uh, at, at certain key gateways. And I think that's what's coming and I think that's what we're gonna see. And we'll see that fairly quickly. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jason and then and then Troy and Jeff, what would, what would be your answer to that question? How do you see the industry changing in the long term? Well, um, from my perspective, you know, the, we, we have kind of seen this and uh, last year we invested a, quite a bit of uh, money and infrastructure into visibility. Visibility is becoming so important where a few years ago, maybe you know five years ago, no one really cared where their container was. It was just on the water somewhere. Now you need to know when it's gonna be here because your demerge and detention can be so incredibly high. Um, trying to get some of that transparency at the ports, um, at the transshipment points, you know, sometimes, you'll be stuck at a transshipment point and you won't know where it is. So getting the best data um, our company has quickly become more of a data company as a logistics company. We're kind of both uh, making sure that you are able to communicate with your forwarder, all of your vendors. Um, so really transitioning to become like a digital freight forwarder or digitization in the industry altogether between the steamship lines and uh, making that information go back and forth between the BCOs, the NVOs and the carriers. Thank you. Troy. Well, that's interesting on the digitization. One thing that um, the, uh, the FMC commissioners just said to us was that uh, one of their priorities is trying to figure out a way to, uh, to improve the communication with ships while they're in transit. I mean, he, he mentioned how you know, 
anyone can go on the internet and see where a plane is anywhere in the world, but but ships they don't, they don't, they don't that technology doesn't exist for for for, for most you know sea uh, you know o ocean going uh, vessels, and that was a surprise to me. So there was a lot of room for um, advancing the technology, the communication, and that should improve efficiency over time. I think um, the infrastructure uh, bill bills, uh, but the one that was just passed by the Senate here just a few minutes ago as we we're getting started here. And, and I'm, I'm hopeful, optimistic it will get through the House, though it may take, may take a little while there. Um, that includes some infrastructure spending that will be a benefit to this. However, um, uh, what, ironically, uh, I've heard some people share the concern that, yes, it will, it should benefit things in the long term. In the short term, it might, it might require, you know, it might want to put even more pressure on the system because materials to do all this major construction with the infrastructure is going to, you know, need to be shipped and that'll consume even more space and more personnel. So, um, so I, there is a, there, there is a silver lining. Crises like this lead to innovation and I have no doubt that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, but I think it's not going to happen next month. It'll, I think we're talking years versus, versus months. Thanks, Troy. Jeff? Sure. Yeah. Let me, uh, you know, here at Maloof, it's kind of funny. Everybody thinks that we're this consumer product uh, company. We, we consider ourselves a tech company and, and have for years, you know, when, when Jason's talking about data and analytics, um, you know, we've, we've got whole teams dedicated to nothing but that when it comes to, you know, software de uh, development uh, and software engineering to help track uh, and know for certain where, where everything is located in, 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 in understanding and having that full visibility and transparency in order to make really critical decisions. I think you're going to see uh, uh, technology and data and analytics and things along those lines. This is going to be absolutely crucial. And then, and then as far as where, where are we heading also, um, you know, from other, in other areas, let me just say this, you know, infrastructure, we're, there's going to be, you know, increased infrastructure. There's got to be increased collaboration, communication, and not just as, in, you know, members in the industry of, of, of say, importers and or uh, those who are involved in global trade, but with government leaders and other like-minded people. You're going to see a return. You're going to have to see, a, you know, basic supply and demand principles are going, you know, and, and, and forces beyond our control, which is, you know, the rising prices are going to force us to go back to really revisit what we already know to be true, which is a return to free and, and fair trade policy works. Um, and, and, and seeing more collaboration across all of those lines. Um, so technology, infrastructure, and collaboration communication, you're gonna see developments in all three of those areas. Well, the, the the future, I think, of the the industry is is exciting. Even if right now it's 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 it seems fairly, you know, uh, the outlook is maybe grim for the next few months or so. I want to come back to Utah's in the port. As Jack mentioned, a huge amount of of um, traffic that's that's imported from the west flows uh, flows eastward inland. Uh, a, a vast majority of that, or, or I shouldn't say a vast majority, quite a bit of that flows through Utah. Logistics dependent industries are really the the heartbeat of Utah's economy. Jack, I want to come back to the inland port. Um, as you talk about how assets are going to be reallocated across the West Coast and even inland, how will that relieve pressure from the ports? And, and how do we expect Utah to be a leader, not only not only as a place to relieve pressure from the ports, but also in in, uh, in digitization and sustainability uh, in, in U.S. logistics? Yeah, it's, yeah we, we truly are the, you know, the crossroads of, of, of not just of the West, we, we are the crossroads of the world, especially in terms of North American logistics. Uh, about 23% of the vehicle truck miles traveled a year in the United States are going through Utah. Uh, so that just gives you an idea of how much, how many goods move through our state, how much of our GDP moves through our state. Uh, we are working closely with the three main West Coast gateways, as well as uh, other uh, you know, inland, inland destinations like Chicago and, and Kansas City, Memphis, Dallas and other places too, to look at how do we optimize the system and make the system work better? How do we, how do we and, and, and using uh, the inland port as a forward staging, forward deployment area in support of the coastal ports so that they can process goods through the coastal ports more rapidly and goods that are meant for inland destination 
that, that uh, some of the value added work gets done here. So some of the transloading, transshipment work gets done here in Utah. That creates efficiency in the system, that creates uh, cost reductions in the system, and creates jobs and opportunity in the system that, that frankly don't exist today. Uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, fragmented system today. It's very sort of siloed in a lot of ways. And so taking better advantage and use of those connections that we have, again, primarily with the three main West Coast ports is, is a key factor in that. It creates a lot of opportunity for us. The industry itself is, is rapidly uh, cleaning up the, it, it, its emissions and its carbon footprint. And, and we have an opportunity because we have a bit of a clean slate here in Utah to be at the forefront of that and position Utah as that center for what the future of logistics and goods movement looks like. So we are working really hard with partners in the in the in the electrical in the electricity industry and in the in the in the in the natural gas and, and advanced fuels industries, uh, OEMs, truck truck manufacturers, equipment manufacturers, and, and research universities. To position Utah as a place for those new technologies and those new developments to be to be tested and, and and proven, but then also deployed as part of that infrastructure mix going forward, looking to the forward of logistics and goods movement. What does that infrastructure mix need to look like? And it's a sustainable infrastructure mess mix, so it's positioned for uh, electrification and zero emissions, advanced fuels, things like that. But also it a technologically advanced infrastructure around the future of automation, autonomous vehicles, some of those kinds of things. So really kind of taking that forward look, we're able to position Utah at the forefront of that. And what's driving really our industry is being driven by the market. It's not being driven by regulation. It's not being driven by tax policy. It's being driven by the market. The market is demanding cleaner, greener logistics and, and reduced carbon footprints. And we have an opportunity to put ourselves at the forefront. So I think those two things are really, uh, really helpful, really, uh, uh, and really bode well for the future uh, of Utah. You, you hit the nail on the head. Man, logistics is the lifeblood of the economy. Our local economy, our regional economy, the global economy, uh, it, it, it all runs uh, because of logistics. And uh, we have the opportunity to really sort of set the stage for what the future looks like. And it is it's very, very bright. It's really exciting. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate the insight. The future really is exciting for Utah. With the time that we have left, I'd like to have I'd like to review a few of the questions that were submitted by our participants. Um, the first uh, this first question here um, is a kind of a tactical question. Um, but Jason, I might ask you to answer first. Should Utah companies be shifting our P, um, our POE from Long Beach, California, to other less congested ports, for example, Seattle, Oakland, or Houston? Yes. Simply yes, yeah. Uh, Long Beach they they do a great job, but it there's there's it it is just crazy busy there. And uh, to get warehousing space to get things on a truck, it just takes forever, and your your charges keep skyrocketing. I mean the other ports are all congested as well, but um, nothing like LA. It, it, just a a little color on that. You know, in 2019. Um, the combined LA Long Beach ports did just around 16 million TEUs. Um, last year, of course, was, they were shut down part of the year. This year, they will do almost over 19 million TEUs of volume. So wow. they went up, what, a 30% increase in, in volume uh, year over year, quite frankly. That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. But yeah, look for alternatives. Thank you both. This next question um, is a bit more policy related. Uh, do you think there will be any policies changing to protect businesses from excessive um, demurrage fees due to port delays? Maybe Troy, uh, I'll ask you to start. Yeah, I'll take a crack at that. Um, so it, uh, President Biden issued an executive order on, on competition uh, just a few weeks ago. And, and, and in that one of the, I mean, it hit a hundred different points, but on, in terms of shipping, that was the main point. It said, you know, let's do an investigation and inquiry into these into these surcharges, see what can be done, see whether it's anti-competitive, whether it's you know illegal, or even if it's not, let's use the bully pulpit to try to you know try to improve the those those types of, of charges, which you know do do feel a little bit like pouring salt into, into the wounds when you know when people are 
already paying so much to, to, to ship goods across. And it's not their fault that the ship that the, that the goods are, are sitting there, you know, not being not being transited. So um, that and and we've confirmed now with the regulators that is in their sites. Um, they haven't. Uh, they've got to gather data. They've got to do the regulatory thing. So it takes a little bit of time. Um, uh, but but that's happening. And and then and so on on the policy front, I think that that is happening. We are also letting the Utah delegation know that that's one of the one of the priorities is because you know, that's a way that costs can be reduced. Um, and then another way that costs can be reduced, potentially, uh, as I think Jason mentioned, we have these, these agreements amongst some of the, the carriers uh, that are legal for them to have, They're, it's through, through an antitrust exclusion, but uh, that, so they, they have that ability to coordinate routes and that sort of thing, whereas in some industries you can't. Um, however, that also lets the regulators have a bit of a say in what they're doing. So, uh, so that's an avenue too, from a policy standpoint. And we're going to push on that in a you know in a friendly way. No one wants to, you know, uh, we're not trying to upend the industry. We need the industry as demand starts to slow a little bit. I mean, right, one thing I, I we touched on, but maybe I mean people should be aware. Of it. Some some of the issues, most of them are you know our infrastructure and, and congestion structural. Some of it is just this incredibly high demand right now. People aren't traveling and they've got stimulus checks, and so they're buying things, and and that will soften somewhat. Um, now, you know, um, with increased wages, uh, it may not soften dramatically, but that will soften a little bit. So I think we can expect things to get a little bit better in the near future. But nonetheless, from a policy standpoint, there are things that need to be fixed and, um, and they, they want to fix them. They need our help in sort of saying, here's, here's, here's where your priorities should be. And that, that's our goal here as a, as a Utah group. Thank you, Troy. Go, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, to, to Troy's point, um, if you push too hard on these carriers, they can sidestep a lot of the issues that we're having. Like, for example, we're actually seeing it quite a bit. A lot of carriers don't want to bring containers inland anymore. They'll just send it to the port. And that's that they can kind of sidestep the demerge and detention issue if they just say, okay, we're only going to, you know, bring this to port. We won't bring it inland. And we'll only give you so many days to unload it. So it kind of puts the onus back on the importers, which is so you can't push too hard on some of these issues. That's right. That's right. Jim, I'm really glad that Troy brought it up, but uh, President Biden's uh, recent executive order there. Um, I mean, obviously, we're talking a very, very narrow, you know, scope of very narrow issue here, which is the marriage. But um, in that order, I mean, it's very clear that, that you are going to see. Um, and it's not just from this. I mean, obviously, here at Maloof, we have our own government relations team internally. We have, you know, a, a fact one of our largest officer, offices in the company is in DC. And so, you know, in talking with our congressional leaders and talking with people on the Hill uh, at the White House, um, you know, I'm at my, I myself, I'm at the White House about every other month. And I've got to be honest with you, um, this, is a, this is a topic that is far beyond just the scope of demurrage. You know, I'm glad that Troy brought it up, that executive order. I'm glad that he also brought it up on the antitrust issues, which are going to get broader. Um, and, and, you know, so going back to your point, Jason, you know, you know, the games that we play operationally, you know, if, you know, be, be forewarned, you know, from, from the carrier standpoint as well, you know, these games, you know, everybody from the US, IT, you know, uh, ITR office to the Department of Commerce, to the White House, to our congressional leaders, they're well aware of this. And, and, and the, the question isn't if this is going to occur, it's going to. Um, the question is when and can it move fast enough, um, and 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 that's the real issue. Um, and so just 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 to, to answer the question from the from the gentleman you know who asked the policy question in the audience, I do believe that you are going to see policy changes here very quickly, um, and, I, and I would even see I would even dare to say that you might even see not just from a regulatory point of view but actual you know congressional action here very quickly. Um, um, the question is, is if is it quick enough? I don't know. I don't know that answer because our government tends to take it, it's a time to actually fix these things. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I've shamelessly saved uh, one question for last. This is the last question from our audience and I've saved it because it's an opportunity for me to plug World Trade Center Utah to all of you before we run out of time. Um, the, the last question uh, here that I'm seeing from the audience is, how can we find new suppliers for niche products that are near shore? 
Um, and, and here's an opportunity for me to plug World Trade Center Utah to, to some extent. Part of the value of having a World Trade Center here in the state of Utah is the vast web of connections that, that we have across the world, both with our, with our World Trade Center partners, but also with partners like those who you're seeing here today on the screen. Utah companies um, who are here to, to facilitate trade, to be the grease you know, on the wheels that makes that makes trade happen and, and are really the most uh, uh, the most affected by it and, and who understand most this uh, this problem. So in terms of finding niche companies uh, or niche manufacturers that are near shore, World Trade Center has organized a, a, a trade mission in October that's going to uh, that's going to Mexico. And as part of that trade mission, we've had the opportunity to connect with with uh, folks from Mexican industry and government, all of whom are, are recognizing these trends and looking to find uh, U.S. companies who could uh, who could shift their manufacturing from a place like China to some place closer uh, to some place like Mexico that may make sense. So um, one thing I would suggest you do is reach out to Aaron Starks. His email is in the chat, um, and and ask him um, and and ask him for some time. Let's let's take some time. Let's talk with you. Let's learn about your product, and then let's reach out to our connections both here in the state and then abroad to see if we can help you find partners. Here at World Trade Center Utah, our goal is to help Utah companies accelerate their growth. And, and right now, the bottleneck to that is supply. It's their supply chains. And if we can help you there, um, then we'll have, we'll have fulfilled our mission and, and done what we, we, we really mean, mean to do here for the state. Um, so with that, thank you all, Jack, Troy, Jason, Jeff, for, for participating in our webinar today. Um, we're grateful for your expertise, for your experience, and for your help here. I hope that... Uh, uh, in the coming days, uh, everyone here on this call will reach out to our partners here uh, on this line and, and ask for help where they need it. Uh, thanks so much for participating, and I believe there'll be a recording of this posted on YouTube once the, once the webinar is over. So with that, thank you all, and have a great day. Thank you, Jim. Thanks. Bye.